I recently just learned that there is a Wordle for doctors called Dr. Dole, and there's also a Medical Connections uh, that is created actually by one of my colleagues at UC Davis that is a really fun and engaging way to practice your clinical reasoning. So let me show you guys real quick, and we will try them out in real time and see how we do. All right, so first we're going to start with Dr. Dole, and this is basically uh, the way it works is you have kind of six clues that it's going to give you piecemeal, and you are going to have to try and come up with the diagnosis. And the earlier you can get it, you know, the higher the score you get. So uh, the first clue that we have here is a 27-year-old man presenting with fatigue, shortness of breath, and hemoptysis over the last two weeks. So um, already the hemoptysis in such a young patient is making me think like, you know, TB is something we always think about, uh, but they didn't give us any clear risk factors yet. Uh, some kind of like vasculitis picture could cause hemoptysis. Um, I wonder what else could be causing hemoptysis, like alveolar hemorrhage, things like that. Yeah, what else, what else would you guys think for this um, kind of aliquot? I think also maybe some kind of uh, like, I don't know, maybe like lymphomas or something, just because he kind of might have some, uh, some kind of constitutional symptoms with the fatigue. Uh, really hard to say. I feel like the easiest one to guess off the first, you know, just to rule out at the very beginning is just tuberculosis. But I feel like it's probably not going to be tuberculosis. So on exam, he is pale and mildly tachypnic with bibasilar crackles heard on lung auscultation. So uh, the paleness kind of suggests potentially he's anemic. And then bibasilar crackles heard on lung auscultation kind of makes me think, Either when it's both, you know, it's bibasilar, it's it's kind of gravity dependent, kind of makes you think of either atelectasis or fluid, whereas uh, crackles all throughout the lungs might make you think more of some kind of interstitial fibrosis kind of disease, which you would not really see in a 27-year-old patient. Um, but yeah, it makes me think of some kind of blood or, or water. So um, actually recently, um, you know, the fact that he's uh, pale and he's got these bibasilar crackles, I am thinking maybe that diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. I don't know if that's one of the answers here. It doesn't look like it is. Uh, I am thinking about like good pasture syndrome. Um, I don't know if it actually presents in this age group, but just because I was, you know, recently doing that talk about nephritic uh, or glomerular nephritis and, um, you know, you could have pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, maybe the, he's pale because he's got some kidney injury and he's anemic from that. And we got the answer right. So <laughs> that was awesome. I actually really, uh, I'm actually really, really happy that I got that so early. So we can actually see what the other clues uh, would have been. So lab testing reveals anemia and elevated creatinine. Chest x-ray shows patchy bilateral alveolar infiltrates. UA demonstrates hematuria and proteinuria. And immunofluorescence detects linear IgG deposition along the glomerular basement membrane. <laughs> so that's awesome. I literally just did that video of that case report of, of nephrotic syndrome. And then I had been talking about good pasture syndrome. Uh, but really, because I think when you have somebody with hemoptysis that's so young, it's got, you, you know, you're thinking like TB or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And then when they're giving you that he's pale, you're thinking that he's anemic. And again, it sounds kind of diffuse alveolar hemorrhagey because he's got bibasilar crackles. All the blood is collecting at the bottom. Uh, so I'm actually very impressed by myself. I did not think I was going to get it so early because my friend actually told me today's was very hard. So that was very satisfying. And so this actually comes out uh, daily. This is my second time doing uh, Dr. Dole. So anyways, I think this is a great resource that you guys should try. Uh, it's just a fun way to practice your clinical reasoning and practice your pattern recognition. So now let's move on to the medical connections. And this is uh, developed by my colleague at UC Davis. And actually, I, I actually took a brief look at this right before I loaded this video up. And uh, it looks like it is another case of nephrotic versus glomerular nephritis. So lots of, you know, kidney injury, spaced repetition for us this week. So if you guys haven't played Connections before, there are four categories that we have to try to match and uh, you know choose four answer choices that all are connected somehow with each other. And then uh, you only have four potential guesses. So if you keep getting guesses wrong, then eventually you might lose. So you'll see how it works as we go through it. So the first one I'm gonna zoom in, um, You know, we just did that talk on nephrotic syndrome, right? So hypoalbuminemia, hyperlipidemia, I'm going to look for anything else that goes with nephrotic syndrome. Uh, and and I, by the way, this just comes out weekly. And it's really difficult um, to do these medical connections because a lot of things kind of overlap a little bit. It's actually very tough to do. I, I feel like the success rate that we've had, we tend to do this before morning reports uh, at our institution. Um, the success rate is kind of low. 
but we've got it in a couple weeks. Uh, so let's see. I don't, I don't really see anything else that's standing out for nephrotic syndrome. So my, why don't we hold, put that on hold for now? I see muddy brown cast, so that's ATN. So muddy brown cast, renal tubular epithelial cells. That's another thing that nephro uh, nephrologists look for for um, ATN. Post ATN diuresis. Uh, this is recovery polyuria that they're talking about. And then I wonder if necrotic tubules. Yeah, I think that I was going to say T-colored urine, but I was like, ah, no, I don't think that's right. And then necrotic tubules, that makes sense. So we're going to submit this group. And then we found the first connections of ATN. So now let's move on to what we think is next. So I think RBC casts and white blood cell casts could go with um, nephritic or glomerulonephritis and dysmorphic RBCs. Um, the thing is, you know, a lot of these things could overlap. That's the thing that makes it difficult. So let's take that off. Maltese cross, I'm thinking of like Babesia, right? I, I, that's what I'm thinking for, but like, that's kind of weird. That's the one that's standing out here. That's kind of different from everything else. Um, it is possible, you know, going back, I'm pretty sure these two are linked and then nephrotic syndrome. What are some common nephrotic syndromes that we might think of? So minimal change disease, we might think of FSGS or, um, membranous nephropathy. Do any of these fit with that? I'm trying to figure out what the T colored urine is. It's like, um, like a post strep glomerulonephritis. So T colored urine, rash, fever, post immune complex deposits that might be post strep glomerulonephritis. Why don't we try that one out? And that is not correct. <laughs> All right. So we've got three guesses left. <clears throat> okay. Urine eosinophils is usually, we look for that in acute interstitial nephritis, fatty casts. When I see that, I feel like it's pretty, it's often a very non-specific kind of finding, but you know, sometimes urine EOs, you can it, acute interstitial nephritis. You might also see a lot of white blood cells. I think you can also see white blood cell casts, um, fever and rash. Maybe, maybe this is, um, gosh, See, maybe this is acute interstitial nephritis. I don't know what the fatty casts are. Let's submit it. Okay, we've got interstitial nephritis. So urine eosinophils, white blood cell casts, rash, and fever. So now I feel like, what did I put for here? T-colored T urine. Dis, so dysmorphic RBCs and RBC casts definitely go together. And I feel like, like what is Maltese cross? I feel like that's babesiosis. Am I just completely out of left field? Like <laughs> completely on the wrong track? And fatty cast. So it must be fatty cast here. And then Im immune complex deposits. If it's like um, membranoproliferative uh, uh, glomerulonephritis, then that could cause nephrotic syndrome and it's mediated by immune complex deposits deposits. Okay. So that was wrong, but it tells you so close you're one away from a correct group. So uh, maybe it's the T colored urine, but T colored urine makes me kind of think of like hematuria. Maybe I just don't know what the Maltese cross is still. I feel like, so maybe I think immune complex deposits was probably the wrong one. Dysmorphic RBCs, RBC casts and T colored urine. I think that sounds like nephritis to me. So glomerulonephritis. I don't know what this Maltese cross is here. Maltese cross. I thought that was, um, let me open up my Anki. I thought that was like babesiosis. <laughs> That's why I'm like completely, you know, not sure what's going on here, but anyway, we did get all four categories, right? And so that's pretty nice. I am pretty happy about that. So you can see how this is a really fun way to practice and gamify your, your kind of, uh, you know, your learning. So let's see Maltese cross. Yeah. So babesia, I'm not totally sure why, uh, Maltese cross is in nephrotic syndrome. Is Maltese cross associated with nephrotic syndrome? We'll take a look at this. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, apparently Maltese crosses in a urine sample is a classic finding associated with nephrotic syndrome. I actually had no idea about that. Uh, so, you know, I learned something from this medical connections.
So I didn't get a chance to finish editing the video that I recorded yesterday. And so today is a new day. There's a new Dr. Dole and I thought I would add this into the video. So we have another example of what a, a, a Dr. Dole might look like. So this case is a 19 year old female presenting with abdominal pain, distension, urinary frequency and constipation. Uh, I'm noticing that a lot of these patients tend to be kind of younger patients. I think it's because maybe it's because uh, younger patients tend to have like new diseases that kind of present without being ever diagnosed for the first time before. I wonder if that's the case, but abdominal pain and distension, urinary frequency and constipation. Ah, this is just really vague because this could be from so many different etiologies. Um, one thing I was thinking is uh, urinary frequency and constipation, uh, maybe like hypercalcemia, I don't know. Sometimes whenever you see polyuria and constipation together, that can be a sign of like that combination classically together um, is a kind of classic combination for hypercalcemia. And I think that would also go with abdominal pain and the distension is probably from gas from constipation. So let's just guess with hypercalcemia. I actually feel pretty good about this. Oh, okay. Shoot. So the only answer is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Uh, but, you know, maybe that would go with the urinary frequency. You know, they don't just have a regular hypercalcemia. I guess it's not specific enough, but let's guess it. I, have a, I actually have sort of a, a good feeling about this one. Ah, no, we're not right. Okay. So let's see. Pelvic exam reveals a painful right adnexal mass. Oh gosh, it's going to be a GYN question. Um, painful right adnexal mass that could cause abdominal pain, distension, urinary frequency, and constipation. Is this like an ectopic pregnancy? Is this like ovarian torsion? I don't think ovarian torsion presents with urinary frequency and constipation, but neither does ectopic pregnancy really. But I think the most likely thing that would happen in this age group with a painful right adnexal mass could be uh, ectopic pregnancy. And then I'm kind of thinking of all those ovarian tumors that you could get and trying to figure out if any of those could cause it. So abdominal pain and distension, could that be ascites? If, if so, then you can think of the theca granulosa tumors. I believe those ones were associated with ascites. I'm not sure if they're associated with urinary frequency and constipation. And then, yeah, again, with ectopic pregnancy and ovarian torsion, I would expect more of it to be focused on the pain. And I wouldn't really be able to un explain the urinary frequency and constipation. Uh, like teratomas maybe, but I, again, I don't see how a teratoma could cause urinary frequency and constipation. So maybe let's go with, um, theca granulosa, uh, ovarian theca lutens. I thought it was theca granulosa tumor, sex cord granulosa cell tumor. Maybe this is it. This is definitely not something I run into, uh, normally when I'm taking care of patients. And that is not correct. Ah, oh, gosh, this is getting harder and harder. So the patient has no elevation in HCG and a mild elevation in LDH. So doesn't sound like it's some kind of pregnancy related thing. We can rule out ectopic pregnancy with negative beta HCG and a mild elevation at LDH. That's kind of concerning to me. You know, when I think of an elevated LDH, I think of a lot of hematologic processes. I think of lymphoma hemolysis, but what could cause a painful right adnexal mass with elevated LDH? Um, this is tough for me. I, I don't know what kind of tumor, maybe let's just type ovarian. This is the problem with the, the wordle here is that, or the doctor dole is like, you can kind of just see what the available op options are. Ovarian corpus luteal cyst. No, none of these. Struma ovary hyperthyroidism. No, I'm not seeing any of these, you know, you know, on my differential, some kind of lymphoma. She didn't, didn't describe any, you know, B symptoms, constitutional symptoms, no fevers. What, what is there for teratoma? Immature teratoma. Could that cause this? I actually don't know. I'm just going to go with Hodgkin lymphoma because of the elevated LDH, but I really don't think this is the right answer. AFP ele levels are elevated. Uh, alpha fetoprotein, so definitely hepatocellular carcinoma can cause elevated alpha fetoprotein. This is the problem, this, this question is GYN focused, so definitely not my strong suit. 
AFP elevated. What else could cause AFP elevation? I know some of the, um, you know, pregnancies, if they have chromosomal abnormalities can cause, uh, or if they have like enphalocele and gastrocele can cause elevated AFP levels. But um, in terms of an ovarian mass or a right adnexal mass that causes elevated AFP, I actually don't know. Sex cord theoma, sex cord. I don't even know what these are. Let's. I don't know what we're getting here. Okay, large solid cystic ovarian mass with intertumoral hemorrhage and necrosis. I still don't know what the diagnosis is. I don't know if I'm gonna get this one. I really don't. I need to brush up on my OBGYN skills, I guess. But I don't. I don't use it day to day. So this is actually a really hard one. Um, I'm just gonna go with the teratoma. I, I'm, I'm running out of diagnoses to uh, to diagnose. Schiller Duval bodies. Okay, I remember that term. I thought that was associated with the theca granulosa tumors, though. Oh, Schiller Duval. Uh, gosh, you know, you remember this from step one, and uh, I, I remember there's a, a sketchy on this as well. Ah, uh, I'm forgetting the name of what tumor this this lines up with, though. What if I just Type tumor, <laughs> yolk sac tumor, uh, Warthin tumor, Sertoli Leydig cell. Is it Sertoli Leydig? I feel like that's in men though, like Sertoli and Leydig cells, but females also have it. Extra gonadal germ cell tumor. That seems like it could be an option. So I was on the right track with trying to figure out tumor Brenner tumor I don't even remember a lot of these Philodes tumor I think I remember was in the breast yolk sac tumor seems like I, I feel like it's Sertoli Leydig is the one that's kind of screaming out to me which is weird because Sertoli Leydig cells are like involved in sperm production but I think women have it as well and I, I think it may be associated with the Schiller Duval bodies so let's uh cross our fingers and no, it was yolk sac tumor so all right well I guess um I guess we, you know, still have stuff to learn every day. So uh, you guys probably were frustrated watching me struggle through that, but that's how this game goes. And that's why I think this is a great tool to use to kind of brush up on your knowledge of things that you might have forgotten. All right. And here you can see going through my prior hockey cards, uh, where is the Schiller Duval tumor? It's somewhere down here. Okay, so what is the characteristic histology finding for testicular yolk sac tumors? It's the Schiller Duval bodies. What is a tumor marker for testicular yolk sac tumors? AFP. So I'm sure anybody who's involved in GYN, this was like a very, very easy question for them. And why don't I take a look at the theca granulosa tumors? Because I remember those also. Uh, yeah, okay, here's another question, uh, another set of sketchy that shows yolk sac tumors being associated with AFP and Schiller Duval bodies. And then granulosa theca tumors, thecoma fibroma, sertoli legatic tumors, they all fall under the ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. And um, this can cause Meg syndrome, which is from thecoma fibroma, fibromas, ascites and pleural effusion. Um, so that's what I was kind of going with, with the thecoma granulosa tumor. But yeah, very interesting and great to review the stuff that I haven't looked at in such a long time. So anyways, I highly encourage you guys to check out these two resources. You can find it at uh, drdole.org, drdole.org. And then the other one is lucyzshe.github.io slash medical dash connections. So I can leave the links down in the comment section below. This is pretty interesting because uh, actually, um, there's actually apparently a leaderboard on the connections. And then I know Dr. Dole keeps track of like your scores over time. So uh, kind of interesting. I am very curious to see how these will grow over time and uh, really fun to just do these. So hope you guys enjoyed this. I just want to showcase this to you guys really quickly. So thanks again for watching. I hope to see you in the next video and until then, good luck and have fun.